competition and rivalry can lead to conflict. And my anxiety is that uh, the conflicts that could occur uh, uh, as a result of that competition will rebound on Earth. Normally when we talk about the moon, um, we talk about it with curiosity, we think about the exploration of the moon, and those conversations uh, will and are already moving on to commercialism. Um, you argue that the moon is set to become the centre point of a celestial land grab. Just to expand on that. Well, first, I should say, of course, that uh, all our traditions about the moon and poetry and song and the influence that the moon has had on all sorts of things, like, uh, for example, our calendar and our, our romantic uh, aspirations, um, makes the moon a rather interesting place for humanity. But the great excitement which attended the Apollo moon landings a long time ago, back in 1969, kind of faded away until just recently. We've seen a lot in the news about all these attempts made by the uh, Indians and Japanese, the Chinese, and uh, some of the private companies sponsored by NASA in the United States uh, trying to get uh, modules landed on the moon. And there's a reason for it. And the reason for it is that the moon is very rich in resources, potentially. It certainly has water ice, which is a, a key ingredient in uh, producing rocket fuel, which, if it is manufactured on the moon, would make exploration of the solar system much easier. But more to the point, there might be very rare minerals on the moon, essential for our very advanced technologies on Earth. And these minerals are in increasingly short supply. And so for the last couple of decades, hundreds of billions of dollars have been invested in uh, getting to the moon with the aim of starting mining operations there. And this is the whole new horizon which is opening up now. A lot of positives. You know, there'll be technological developments. There'll be an expansion of human imagination in all sorts of ways, but also very serious risks. Yeah, certainly. One of those um, rare earth materials, uh, to give our listeners an example, is lithium. That's really important for the manufacture of electric cars. It goes into batteries, doesn't it? Um, and that is one example. It's in short supply on Earth. And so, um, you know, in a resource rich moon, um, we're obviously very interested, as our private companies, Elon Musk and SpaceX and Jeff Bezos, too, are interested in exploring it. Um, how much of this is also about ego. In the past, you know, if you look at the space race between the Soviet Union and the US, you know, much of that appetite to get to the moon was fueled by ego. Um, how much ego do you think is involved in interest from private companies in trying to capitalise on what the moon has to offer? Is there a humanitarian benefit to this? Or are they just looking at profit, do you think? It's going to be a mixture of both ego and profit, I think. I mean, back in the 1960s, for example, after Yuri Gagarin uh, orbited the Earth, it made the United States realize that they were lagging behind the USSR at that time in uh, space exploration. And uh, the in great endeavor of putting men on the moon by the end of the 1960s was really a kind of Cold War rivalry thing because the Americans wanted to say, our rockets are bigger than your rockets. You know, it was a macho standoff. And at that time, the idea of settlements on the moon or mining on the moon, that was science fiction then. But it isn't now. So it's a mixture of uh, the, the great quest for profit. I mean, all those hundreds of billions of dollars I talked about are expected to bring a return. There's no question about that. But also, it is a matter of status. And all those who are competing to get there to be for to really lead the way in what's happening in outer space really do want to get the status that comes with it. So very much so, it's a mixture of both. Now, on Virgin Experience Days, I don't know whether you've ever come across them, Anthony, you, you can buy a piece of the moon, an acre for £26. Pounds. Um, the title of your book is called Who Owns the Moon? Who does? Who does own the moon? Well, really, nobody does. Uh, I mean, the United Nations Treaty, um, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which again was a Cold War treaty, trying to uh, dissuade people from putting nuclear weapons on the moon or to use the moon as a, a site for nuclear weapons testing. It, it said what uh, happens on the moon must not include anything military, but otherwise, it's anybody's. If you can get there, you can more or less do what you like there. 
they made it a, a, what's sometimes called a global common good. That means that if you have the capacity, you have the resources, the technology, then if there are resources on the moon, they're up to you to take. And this is where the problem kicks in, because it does make the moon a bit of a wild west. You can imagine, you know, with all the huge investment, all the effort and time that it takes to get there and, and pretty soon in the next few years to start extracting some of those resources, there will be a lot of potential for competition. For and competition and rivalry can lead to conflict. And my anxiety is that uh, the conflicts that could occur uh, uh, as a result of that competition will rebound on Earth. Yeah, let's expand on that. You write that the race for profit and power is a path to disaster, and you compare it to the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century. You use that example of showing how destabilising such lust can be. Tell me where this goes then. Well, you know, um, one thing we have to remember is that uh, most of us who are alive today have lived through a very unusual period in human history until, you know, the last five, ten years or so. We've had a largely um, peaceful time, especially in the West, at a time of prosperity and cooperation. But that's unusual in human history. And human history is much, much more about rivalries and about conflicts. And those rivalries and conflicts are generated by the lust for um, resources, for power, for wealth. The profit motive is a, is a key driver of what has happened in the past. Let me think about the great explorations of the 14th and 15th centuries, the Portuguese navigators and so on. And that phenomenon is exactly what's offering itself to us now. So I used the example of the scramble for Africa, which is a, a, an extraordinary period in history when the European major European powers simply divided an entire continent between them as if there was nobody there and as if their interests simply didn't matter when they did notice them. And this this kind of, of gold rush phenomenon, this this frontier, Wild West frontier phenomenon, which we've seen in the case of the United States in the 19th century, in the case of Australia, in so many cases in, in history, that is now ready to happen again. And this, this is where the problem arises. And how do we try and legislate or how do we try and find some order in in how we deal with the moon its ownership its resources how do you how do you divvy, divvy it up uh, if that's what you do <laughs> well uh, the, the very least that is required it's a very robust a very solid international treaty really the united nations of course uh, attempted this back in 1967 although in a rather minimal way because at that time none of what was happening today was even envisaged. They tried again later on in 1979, and most of the big players in this who were looking forward to the opportunities offered by, by space didn't want to sign up to it. And so the very best that the United Nations could do then was to get a kind of statement of aspirations. Let's all be good chaps. You know, let, let's behave ourselves out there. Uh, but what, what, what we really need is a very, very serious framework, an arrangement of regulations with some teeth, with some enforceability. So there are remedies for bad behavior uh, if it occurs. M maybe a space court where um, disputes could be adjudicated. But, but at any rate, even though we know that treaties, even the very best of them, like, for example, the Antarctic Treaty of 1961, it's often held up as a model of an international treaty that really has protected the Antarctic continent. That treaty is fraying at the edges now. And, and we know because that people will... Well, I'm, I'm afraid that is very much uh, part of the story. Uh, and a really interesting thing about that is this. The Antarctic Treaty of 1961 said that those countries that laid claim to sovereignty over parts of the Antarctic should park those claims and no new parties should lay claim to parts of the Antarctic. But now the Chinese, having developed uh, half a dozen research stations on the continent, are saying that the, the region, I mean, this is hundreds of, of square kilometers around their research stations, should be regarded as their own special interest zone, which is really rather a sneaky way of asserting a kind of sovereignty. And that will happen on the moon. And it will happen on the moon for the following reason. Supposing you have e even an unmanned uh, um, station on the moon, doing some mining, getting some payload of very rare materials back to Earth. 
You don't want anybody else landing anywhere near you, apart from the danger of being sandblasted or having your equipment knocked over or, or put out of action. You, you don't want your access to those geological resources being interfered with by a rival. And so that is rich in, in potential for, for trouble, for mm -hmm. conflict, for arguments. And, and it's this kind of consideration, you know, when you look back over the recent history of, of uh, um, United Nations efforts in particular, to try to get the international community to agree on uh, how to behave, how to cooperate, how to protect uh, Earth itself and, and um, uh, outer space from being a new zone of, of uh, problems. And, you know, the United Nations is, is wonderful in its aspirations because it always encourages peace and cooperation and, and progress. But unfortunately, the profit motives and the power motives yeah. They're not the same, and it thing. doesn't always work. We've, you know, seen that with conflict with the with the Middle East. Israel um, has uh, never been a, a fan of the UN, um, and that informs um, some of their disregard for what the UN are trying to do um, in that conflict. Um, let's come back down to earth now and just talk a little bit of politics if we can, uh, Anthony. We're joined by uh, Professor uh, Anthony Grayling, AC Grayling, as uh, as he's known as an author. Um, you are part of a campaign that wants to rejoin the European Union. Um, I'm sure you get this question a lot. It is probably one of the few things that Labour and the Conservatives have in common a reluctance to reopen the referendum debate. It is. It has, um, like the whole issue of Brexit has exhausted people. It feels like we've got to a position where, we've, where we are in so deep, um, uh, everything has been uh, established, uh, so that we've now got to try and make a go of it. We've now got to make it work for us rather than talk about rejoining the European Union. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily agree with that. No, I don't at all. I mean, you know, we're talking, if you're looking at this in historical terms, we're talking about very, very early days, relatively speaking. In, but uh, in, in this period, since we actually left the EU on the 1st of January 2020, we've seen a very rapid decline uh, in, in our economy. We've seen huge difficulties ar arising, divisions in society, a very acerbic debate in a way, because, you know, think of it this way. Uh, after the joining of the European Economic Community back in the 1970s, those who were against doing so continued to argue and to fight rather on the margins for a long time. And when you know the EU came into existence early in the 1990s, uh, they seemed to be even more marginalised. But here they are now, uh, having managed to get the um, the United Kingdom out of the EU on pretty dodgy grounds and a pretty dodgy referendum, we, we see those who were keen to be part of the EU story uh, fighting much, much more vigorously, much more loudly and much more determinedly than the Eurosceptics ever did. So I feel very confident indeed that the argument for our membership of very least of the single market, which just in plain economic good sense, but for being, you know, one of the leading nations in the European Union, working together with uh, our partners, our kin in Europe, for this uh, very imaginative project, which is really a peace and progress and cooperation project, a model for how the world should be, rather than going back to all the nationalistic divisions that have caused mm. so many problems is in there, the past. Look, I mean, briefly, is there an argument to say that we've not, you know, we, 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 we've not even started to exploit some of the opportunities Brexit does provide us? We are early in, and so therefore we should, we should sit a little on it and look at the opportunities afforded to us uh, rather than just, you know, try and duck straight out of it again. Well, quite frankly, I don't know what those are. I mean, the, the, uh, the evidence seems to press so firmly in the opposite direction, putting ourselves as a relatively modest, moderate-sized uh, economy and state mm. right out of partnership with uh, Lots a, of a other, huge... I mean, France and Germany are you know, also struggling with their economy as well, so it's not, it's not just a Brexit Britain thing, is it? Yeah, but that, you, that kind of comparison simply won't do, because if you look at the numbers and if you look at the, the trajectory of recovery in those major economies after the COVID crisis, you see that there is something which is a ball and chain on the ankle of the UK economy. Uh, and it's a, it's a major problem. 
you know, very often when people discuss uh, uh, price rises and what's happening with the NHS, we talk about our, our domestic political situation and the difficulties that uh, we're facing politically here. The, the reluctance to recognize that a, a huge amount of this problem is loss of tax revenues, a massive hit on our economy, four or five. In, in, in some cases, people talk about 6% uh, reduction in GDP. These are hundreds of billions of pounds that we're talking about here, hundreds of billions of pounds that be going to our health service, looking after people who in, in care, um, our education system. And, and this is, a, a, it's as if we were taking money and just burning it for the, I don't know, fantasy of, of being the old empire again, of being, you know, the Britain of the 19th century. Mm. And I'm afraid all those ships have sailed. We really need to wake up and see that uh, the destiny that, that we have offered to us here, because we're, we're, we're a, a country that can have a leading role in Europe, and we should be taking that role. Okay. Uh, well, look, thank you so much for speaking to us. Um, uh, that is, of course, probably a debate to, expend, to extend upon another day, but it's been really lovely speaking to you. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated um, by your book as well. Um, uh, it reads brilliantly and it poses all sorts of existential questions as we look forward uh, to conflict in the future. Who owns the moon uh, in defence of humanity's common interests in space? Uh, by AC Grayling, Anthony Grayling, who we've been speaking to this evening. Uh, the book is out today. Good luck. Thanks for speaking to us.